Coming up on this Thanksgiving edition of One Detroit, it's our most interesting people episode. From Danny Raskin, still writing at 101 years old, to Kiana Broden, a Detroit chef that's not only making great vegan food, but teaching you to cook it. To Kresge eminent artist Marie Wu on inspiring the next generation, to celebrating the life of Detroit DJ Robin Seymour. It's all coming up on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. And viewers like you. Hey, One Detroit, I'm Christy McDonald. So glad that you're with me. Hope you're still digesting all of that good turkey. Maybe you Zoomed with your family, bought a few things in some early Black Friday sales, and now you're settling in for some good TV. Well, we've got it for you. Coming up, it is our Interesting People episode. From Kiana Broden, a chef hustling every day to help people eat better, to the mastery of Marie Wu's pottery, to remembering the DJ that launched 1,000 hits, Robin Seymour. And we're starting with writer Danny Raskin. At 101 years old, he's covered a lot of stories. You may have seen his byline in the Detroit News. You may still be reading his restaurant columns in the Jewish News. And after thousands of stories kept in folders and computer files, he still has a lot to say. One Detroit's Bill Kubota has Danny's story. Here's the original menu from uh, London Chop House. Dinner on the town in Detroit, you know, now in decades past. Oh, this was a this was the a nationally known restaurant in Detroit. The city has a rich dining history. Restaurants that are mainstays, some long gone. That's a hoopa. Danny Raskin can tell you something about everything. Yeah, you, you light it up, big big deal. <laughs> that's flaming cheese. Yeah, you know, you don't order that. That that's just a sideline. The, the big thing are the the lamb chops in a Greek restaurant. Raskin lives by himself in West Bloomfield, 101 years old. He knows a lot of people. I knew a bunch of the boys from the Purple King. That was back in the 1930s. Really nice guys. They were young fellows, young boys. But they were nice guys. They hurt anybody who would be among themselves. With the Purple Gang, he saw a bit of gunplay, but no one got shot. Not while he was around. Raskin, too, was just a kid, I never knew but I then he found a career. I, I, I never knew I was going to write for a paper. As a newspaper man, he's been writing for more than 80 years, the last 78 with the Jewish News in Metro Detroit. But before that, he was with the Detroit News, just as World War II was getting started. I was a cub reporter. I was sent out. The guy was selling pigeons. In those days, it was pretty bad with the war on. Raskin filed his report. The editor stole his byline. Must have been a pretty good story. There was a regular pigeon from the, from the street. The guy was picking them up, putting them in the truck, selling them to the people as doves to eat. And people were buying them. Was that when you decided you wanted to be a food writer? No. <laughs> After the pigeon story, he joined the Jewish News starting with its first edition. I went to work with them about 42. Here he had more than a byline. He had a column called The Listening Post, reporting on the younger generation and their whereabouts around town and overseas. It came years after the war was over when Raskin turned his attention to food. And I went across the street to the chef's delicatessen, had something I liked about it, I wrote about it. He had beef brisket oh, with a big right, loaf of right bread. From that, he started a new column on the Food and Fun Guide page. There was a picture called Best of Everything. 
Box office gold, the best of everything, kind of a patent place in New York City that had more about whining than dining. And other things, too. Raskin's best of everything stuck to the food. Since December 1965, columns come every week. Man alive. A lot of columns. More columns written than anybody in the nation. That's what I was told. These are columns. Here, I got them. All kinds of columns. Look. Columns. Right. Got a thousand columns. That's right. just yeah. on his computer. There are more than 10,000 overall. Now, these are ones that I'm, I've got to write about yet. I've got tobacco, uh, big, big Alora. These are choices that I'm writing about. With the best of everything, Raskin's a food writer, but never a critic. Sometimes I'll go to a restaurant and I won't say nothing. Nah. I don't like to bum rap a, a restaurant. I hate, to, I hate that. Because they got too much money on the, uh, in the restaurant. Some of these guys, they got the last dollar in there. Yeah, I don't want to put them out of business. Still, Raskin yeah. will tell readers what he really likes. I'll only go to a deli where they cut it by hand. Now, in those days, they had machines that would chop, and it would be very, very thin. When it's cut by hand, you get a nice piece. Danny, can I get just one more? Raskin's received a lot of recognition over the years. Some comes on a plate. Uh, so this is our sandwich number 100, our Danny Raskin. And we put it on our menu last year to celebrate Danny's 100th birthday. The Danny Raskin at the Stage Deli in West Bloomfield. Meatloaf on Hala with a bit of horseradish and sweet pickle. This sandwich is a classic and it's going to stay on the menu with 100 for a while. If he makes it, God willing, to 105, then we'll think about uh, a new sandwich with that number for him. This is just one of many Danny Raskin sandwiches on menus across okay. Detroit. But what the hell? Big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Where does Detroit's past restaurant glory stand next to today's food scene? Old timers say that the years ago it was better. Baloney. The restaurants today are getting better than they were then because you had better food, better service, everything all the way around, especially downtown Detroit. Still, some of us like looking back at what once was. Yeah, so I always enjoy his reminiscence of restaurants that uh, at one time or another held a significant place in the Detroit community, are now gone, and it brings up a nice memory. One of the many places Raskin writes about then and again, a lost west side landmark at Seven Mile in Wyoming. They just say, I'll see you at Darby's. It's been years ago. Darby's oh, opened yeah. in 1955. It seated 500 people. Oh, yeah, it was a terrific operation. Oh, my God. A restaurant and delicatessen all in one until 1968. They had a fire, big fire, and people were crying, watching the flames, but they never found out how, how it started. People still want recipes for the delicacies served there. Oh, yeah. There'll never be another Darby's. There are others, the chop houses, the seafood joints, the fine dining with skyline views. But Raskin has one tip for diners wherever they go. Be curious. Ask questions. The one thing that people don't do is ask the wait person, what is this on the menu? Point to something. What is it? The wait person, if they don't know, don't eat it. 10,000 columns, 10,000 restaurants. Does eating out increase longevity? Could be. But Danny Raskin has a regimen. Barbells? Yeah. <laughs> Is that how you get to be 101? Yeah. That's how you do it. Now, before COVID, we were shooting our One Detroit shows at various restaurants and cafes around the Detroit area, and we always like to talk with the owners and the chefs to really get a sense of the place. Well, Kiana Broden runs The Kitchen by Cooking with Q on Woodward in Midtown. She's part teacher, makes vegan food taste delicious, and is all family. You know when you walk into a place and it just feels like home, and then the chef comes out and hugs you and calls you family? 
Well, that's what it's like when you walk into the kitchen with Cooking with Q on Woodward in Detroit. Kiana Broden specializes in plant-based dishes, and people asked her so many times how to make certain things that she turned her place into a sort of performance kitchen so you can enjoy and learn at the same time. And her energy is contagious. My goal was not to be a chef. It was not to open up a restaurant. I got sick. I found out I had stage four sarcoidosis right before I turned 30. And then I was allergic to dairy at the same time. It was like the end of the world. You know what happens when you get sick? Everybody Googles it. <laughs> we go to WebMD. Like, right, like, exactly. We're sick. instantly wearing a white coat. I'm We're like, like, okay, now I I'm going to figure this out. And everything was plant-based. So I knew I had to just drop everything cold turkey. Like there was no, like, oh, well, wait, because I have munchkin. So my brain was like, I don't want to kill myself. I want to live. So I got to figure out what I got to do. So I started wanting to make everything that you, I would eat normally plant-based. People ask me so many times, Q, how did you change your diet? How did you change your diet? How did you change your diet? I was like, I'm going to create a website. And I'm going to show you all the recipes I make so you don't have to think twice about it. Q, how'd you make this? Boink, here it is. Mm -hmm. I made mac and cheese. That's like the crowd favorite in our family, right? Mm -hmm. How do you make a vegan mac and cheese? I made a vegan mac and cheese. Literally the day I pushed post the vegan mac and cheese, the next day I got a call from Veg Michigan saying they had a festival and the person who was supposed to be doing their vegan mac and cheese was backing out and they needed me to do vegan mac and cheese. You feel like you've got some, you've got some spiritual intervention here. All day. That's where it comes from. It's not me. I cannot take credit for this. So you start telling people just what you're doing and sharing it with them. They start doing it, and then the idea becomes, I gotta get a place. Yeah, because you make a blog for people to see the recipes, but then they're like, show me how to make the recipes. So I wanted to show people how to make the food. People learn in a, in a comfortable environment. They learn better at home or when they're in a space where it's intimate, not too many people. There's not a thousand people that can fit in here, because it's not about the money for me. It's about making sure that I connect with the person that wants to learn how to eat better. So where do you get the funding? I apply for everything that you can get. Sue Mosey and the people in over Midtown, at Midtown yeah. Detroit, and they're my landlords. I emailed her probably every day for like 90 days. And it was just like, hey, you know I'm doing this around the city. Hey, I really love to be in Midtown. Hey, this would be great. People in the suburbs were like blasting me like, we will pay for your build out. Build it in the suburbs. But I was born and raised in Detroit. And this is not something that they would put in the city of Detroit. When I was little, they never brought me to a place like this. I wanted to put it in the city of Detroit so I could bring people to see what you can be. You can do this in Detroit. So I walk in this space and it's, it's bright, it's happy, there's a, just a, there's a different kind of vibe here. And when we walked in, you said, hey family, and I've, walked, I've watched a bunch of stuff online from you, and you're like, hey family, what is it about that greeting? What is it about the people that walk in the door here that is family to you? It has to feel like home. Like for me, for us, our entire family, we are very close knit, it's family. Family helps family. So when people came to this space, I wanted them to feel like they were at home, and I wanted them to feel like it was a part of family. So I'm like, hey, walk around like you own the place. So can meat eaters coexist peacefully with the plant-based eaters? Yeah, I think that's why people like me. It's yeah. like, let me just show you how you can eat better. I'm not telling you can't have everything. I'm just saying, make sure you focus on what you eat, no matter what it is, no matter what avenue you come from. We just want you to learn how to eat better. Turning now to the pottery of Marie Wu. She's the 2020 Kresge Eminent Artist, and maybe you've seen her work or bought tiles with her signature color, Wu Blue. At 92 years of age, she's inspiring the next generation of artists. We caught up with Marie right after she received her award. Uh, a lot of potters and, uh, are inspired by my work, which I'm happy about. I'm the first Potter, and I'm the first Asian. I'm the first Chinese to be uh, nominated and awarded. It's wonderful. I went to graduate school at Cranbrook, and I wanted to study with Maya Grotel. She was a very dedicated artist, and she w was very influential and inspiring, and she was my role model. And she was uh, very uh, knowledgeable as far as glazes are con concerned. Glaze really is the combination of art and chemistry, and um, really if you simplify glaze, it's really a glass coating that goes on the surface of ceramics. Um, but to formulate it is fairly complex, and it's something that, um, you know, Marie was able to do in her variety of glazes that still can be found in our studio today. This is our Woo Blue Brown on the different clay bodies that we have here available at the studio. Um, and so anywhere from a porcelain to a stoneware, you can kind of see that surface variation that students are really excited about. The now stone. there are so many young potters that I, I don't know them, but 
I'm, I'm very happy they, they like my glazes. They use uh, woo yellow and woo, woo blue. And I, I, I just, I hope it works for you. <laughs> oh, this was taken uh, in Nepal, Kathmandu, BC. BC means before children. We were very young in the 60s. I traveled and noticed that folk pottery was just dying out. So I decided before they disappear, I should do some documenting and researching. And so it became a symposium and an exhibition. Then it became a traveling show, about 40 pieces. It traveled from the Midwest to the East to museums. 2019, I said, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> so I donated quite a few pieces. Usually when you donate pieces to a museum, it goes in storage and it's never seen again. But I want the students to handle and study them. In 1981, Puabic became a 501c3 nonprofit organization and she joined the board at that time. In those days, it, uh, nonprofits were very difficult. They were always in the red. And so when, when they're in the red, they want to eliminate education classes. Some people and I fought for education. Historically, Marie really advocated for this program and at a time where maybe it didn't make a lot of sense, she had this kind of forward-facing vision of what this could be. It's kind of nice to see today that we've become, I think, what she envisioned, you know, 30 years ago. This clay piece here is actually, I, I wanted it black all the way like this, but it came out of the kiln with all this texture. Wonderful. And then I took the hands and glued them on and made the, uh, it as a wall piece. I think it, that works pretty well. One really fun aspect that's come from the last few weeks of Marie popping around after winning this award is a lot of our students, um, we kind of encourage them to have goals of things that they should be working towards. And now there's this kind of similar goal that's been popping up since Marie came here and in, in that everyone wants to loosen up the way that they work with clay. And so I think that's something that's really unique about Marie. She has these incredible skill sets, but she has this kind of loose nature about working with clay that, that's very organic and kind of, um, um, you know, has been very like magnetic for our students. And so I'm kind of finding now that the students kind of all have this shared goal of like loosening up like Marie. I am started as a, this piece as an experiment. So I took these very uh, individual pieces and fire them and then I stacked them up and put some glue in between and it became a piece of sculpture after it's fired. It, I think it works pretty well but by itself each piece would not work but together it's a, it's a whole She's just so lovely and, and I think just simply loves what she does. Her resume is pretty outstanding and she's someone that, you know, her impact isn't a secret. And so I expected her to almost carry that more than she does, but she's very open and um, infectious. I'm just uh, trying to express how I feel and what I can do with the clay as a, a way to express m myself. I don't want to fight it, I just sort of go with it. Hopefully, my experiments will work. Some do and some don't. <laughs> And finally, a look at a new documentary from Detroit Public Television on the life and career of Robin Seymour. If you grew up here in Detroit, chances are he narrated your musical memories as one of the most popular DJs starting back in the 1950s. He passed away in April of this year, but his role in Detroit broadcasting history won't be forgotten. Roll over Beethoven, dig to the rhythm and blue. Oh yeah, that was a real mover, Chuck Berry. Hey, by the way, Chuck Berry is coming to the Riviera Theater in three weeks. Tell you more about him. He you can get always had a youthful kind of verve.
he always sounded younger than he was, and he was very, he had that effervescence to his voice. He would get you excited. The road for the best in pop tune favorites. He could listen to a record and say, this guy's gonna be great, or this gal's gonna be great. I had a good, a good music sense, let me put it to you that way. No, he definitely had an ear. Occasionally he'd be wrong, but not very often. He always was good at picking out who was gonna be good and who wasn't. But we always laugh because he couldn't have been that great because when he heard Elvis Presley, he said, this guy's gonna bomb. And so uh, that was not the case. I mean, the records we were playing, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an idea. I, I, I don't even know what happened to I remember playing a record by an artist called Bull Moose Jackson. I love you, yes, I do. And probably the first record by a black person that was ever played on a radio station in Detroit, other than, I think the only other station there that was WJLB. But I dug it, it was a sound. He knew you liked the song, it didn't matter, you know, what uh, what what color their skin was to, uh, to to groove on the music. To be able to shift beyond what they were playing in those days, the Frank Sinatra's and the Tony Bennett's, and to move that into, it was called race music at the time, it was black artists and they're on the radio. Oh my goodness, this is, this is unheard of. Here's a young man having a ball, Little Willie John from our city of wheels to do his big moving hit, Fever. And I would go in to play a Johnny Cash, and then <laughs> we'd play a Little Richard. Nobody ever heard of him. Dearborn Station playing Little Richard records. That was, during those times, uh, kind of a bold move. So he was getting R&B in. He was slipping it in before any other disc jockey in Detroit, really. That was just a revolutionary thing to do, an incredible gift to the listeners of Detroit. It really started to become more and more common. And as rock and roll came in, he was the guy. Fred Norv, he used to get a lot of flack when he'd go down to the DAC, the Detroit Athletic Club. These guys would say, hey, I hear those black records all the time that are being played on your station. Now, what's going on, Fred? He would come back to me and say, Robin, could you sort of lighten up a little bit? He didn't care, but he was a little bit Felt funny about that, you know, these good old straight-laced white dudes down at the DAC really tried to give him the knife, you know. Fred, to his feeling, would say, you know, this is making us money. Obviously, this is what people want to hear. So go for it, kiddo, go for it. That's one of today's top tunes, Little Richard and Tootie Fruity. He felt real close to the audience. So, you know, I also think that it was he, he was one of the first guys to really want the opinion of the kids. You know, every afternoon we take the flyer of the day, Robin's flyer of the day, we think is going to go on to become a great big hit. Why do fools fall in love? Kids would come up and sit there on the floor in the other studio and they'd dance and do their homework. You know, the thing that Robin was able to do, he was able to gain the trust of his audience. Why do fools fall in love? And that's a very hard thing to do and a very delicate thing to keep. But once you get it, you can lead your audience to places that maybe they don't even want to go or they don't even know about. You pick out your own records. You either stood or fell on what you could bring to the audience. And I was young enough to be close enough to the teenage kids to still be thinking like them. And check back to OneDetroitPBS.org for when you can see the full documentary. All right, it's a Thanksgiving holiday. The pandemic makes it strange. A lot of people won't be with loved ones, but hang in there. We are taking it day by day and hope you found some time to be thankful for just the little things in life. Here at One Detroit, we are thankful for you. So here's the One Detroit team with their thanks for the year. I'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Chris, the editor of One Detroit. Happy Thanksgiving for me and TomTom. Tom. Stay safe and enjoy the holiday. Hey, this is Ozette with One Detroit, wishing you a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you get a chance to enjoy some of your favorite food, enjoy some of your favorite music and shows, and your favorite people. Stay safe and stay healthy.
everybody, have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Tis the season. Time for turkey. And a haircut. From me. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving from One Detroit. This year I'm grateful for the opportunity to meet with you all every Thursday at our weekly COVID-313 town halls. Hear the questions that are on your mind and help get you answers. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm thankful at the end of this very trying year. We're all still here. We're all still getting together, looking for better days ahead. Happy Thanksgiving. Despite all the hardship we've experienced this year, there are still things to be thankful for. Be safe, be well, and celebrate. Hey, it's Christy. This is what I usually get to look at when I'm shooting the show here at my house. This is going to be a strange holiday for our family. We are still missing my husband, Jamie, every day, but we are so grateful for the love and support from all of our family and friends. So we're taking it one day at a time. Happy Thanksgiving. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. Ally. And viewers like you.